Benjamin Bugsy Siegel was a complex figure born to Jewish immigrants in 1906 amidst a bustling New York City. His upbringing was entrenched in the environment of the time, a melting pot of diverse cultures and opportunities. Bugsy's parents, Max Siegel and Jenny Richenthal, arrived in the United States from Galicia, a region in Eastern Europe around 1900. They met, married and began their family, with Bugsy being their second child among six siblings. From an early age, Bugsy showed little interest in traditional academics. His educational journey halted in the eighth grade when he dropped out of school. This decision seemed to pave the way for a different path in life, one that wouldn't adhere to conventional norms or societal expectations. Bugsy was a man of contradictions. He grew up amidst the bustling streets of New York, where he observed the rise of bootlegging and the allure of the underworld. He immersed himself in this environment, becoming one of New York's top bootleggers and associating with the mob. However, there was another side to Bugsy, a man who harbored dreams far beyond the confines of a gangster's life. He was a man of ambition, desiring a life beyond the shadows. Bugsy yearned for the glamour of Hollywood and the allure of the acting world. His aspirations were eclectic, ranging from dreams of exploring ancient treasures on a deserted island to envisioning the creation of a lavish casino in the heart of the desert. Yet Bugsy was more than a mere dreamer. He was a man of action, someone who could swiftly shift from being a loving family man to an impulsive bandit or a calculating businessman to an adventurous risk-taker. His life was a paradox, existing between the realms of legitimacy and crime, compassion and ruthlessness. His story stands apart from conventional narratives. Unlike the rational characters of the past, Bugsy was driven by emotions, guided by his dreams, and motivated by a fiery passion that often led him to extremes. His actions were often bloody, selfish, and cruel, but beneath it all lay the heart of a dreamer, one willing to chase the unconventional. Despite the complexity of his character, Bugsy's life was a testament to the unexpected turns one's dreams could take. His journey led him down paths both notorious and remarkable, showcasing a man whose life story transcended the boundaries of law and convention. In the annals of gangster lore, the name Benjamin Bugsy Siegel often emerges as a figure of intrigue and notoriety. His early life, colored by the bustling streets of New York City, hinted at the tempestuous journey ahead. Bugsy's youthful days were marked by a defiance of convention and a disregard for the ordinary. A particular incident involving Monk Eastman, a famed gangster of the time, shed light on the burgeoning nature of Bugsy's character. During a drunken episode, Eastman recklessly used a gun for target practice, aiming at the school windows. Miraculously, the children, including Siegel, emerged unharmed. This incident offered a glimpse into Bugsy's fearless disposition, revealing an early manifestation of his explosive temperament and a defiance of danger. His story truly commenced with an unexpected friendship forged with Maya Lansky, a connection that would weave its way into the tapestry of gangster history. Their paths collided in a street fight, where a gun inadvertently came into play. Ready to unleash its power, Bugsy's hand was stayed by Lansky, who intervened just in time to avert catastrophe. Thus began a friendship that would become one of the most notorious alliances in gangster lore. Despite the four-year age gap between Meyer, age 16, and Benny, a mere 12-year-old at the time, the latter exuded a more formidable and belligerent aura. His fiery temper often overtook him, propelling him into conflicts where his anger knew no bounds. It was during this time that Bugsy earned the moniker Bugsy, derived from the phrase crazy as a bedbug. Unfond of this nickname, calling him such often resulted in a swift, violent response, usually ending in a broken nose for the offender. As their friendship solidified, Lansky and Siegel found themselves leading a small gang that imposed its dominance by extorting street vendors. This form of juvenile delinquency was a common trope among teenage Jewish gangs of the era. Intimidation tactics were employed, demanding money from shopkeepers and resorting to vandalism or arson if their demands were unmet. Bugsy found solace and a sense of belonging within this gang, revealing his inherent traits at their zenith, a proclivity for conflict and an unabashed love for the rush of adrenaline. He was akin to a fish thriving in the tumultuous waters of gangland. His penchant for trouble reached a crescendo when he orchestrated his first major crime 
an audacious robbery of a local moneylender. The thrill of success surged through him as he sprinted through the streets with his ill-gotten gains, reveling in the unspeakable rush that accompanied the successful heist. The Roaring Twenties, marked by Prohibition, provided a backdrop against which Bugsy's adventurous and rebellious spirit flourished. His trajectory was set, destined for the turbulent currents of an era teeming with crime, prohibition, and the allure of the underworld. In the annals of criminal history, the tale of Benjamin Bugsy Siegel stands as a testament to audacity and recklessness, defined by actions that defied his age and societal norms. At a mere 14 years old, Bugsy's tenacity and brazenness knew no bounds, plunging headfirst into bootlegging escapades that most teenagers could scarcely fathom. It was Meyer Lansky who shared a pivotal role in Bugsy's journey, steering the duo towards a path fraught with danger and opportunity. Together, they ventured into the world of illegal liquor trade, a venture uncommon for adolescents of their age. Their alliance wasn't a mere dalliance, it was a joint enterprise, renting out their fleet of trucks to bootleggers and offering security services for transporting contraband. But the foray into bootlegging wasn't an immediate leap. Initially, the duo, along with their gang, pilfered alcohol warehouses even before Prohibition took hold. They brazenly targeted other bootleggers, plundering their goods and trucks, subsequently reselling the stolen items for profit. It was this unabashed audacity that propelled their gang to prominence. However, their ascent to the echelons of the bootlegging world escalated when Lansky secured a connection with Arnold Rothstein. Initially working under Rothstein's wing, guarding trucks laden with contraband, Bugsy and Lansky gradually gained experience and independence. This newfound expertise saw them embark on their own ventures, smuggling alcohol from Canada and selling it clandestinely within the States. Their operation burgeoned, branching out into a network of underground bars in New York. With a fleet of trucks at their disposal and a burgeoning wealth, Bugsy, who was merely 20 years old, by the mid-1920s, found himself at the helm of an empire that defied convention and legality. Rothstein's method of operation played a pivotal role in their rise. He maneuvered by financially backing businesses and then claiming a share of the profits. Lansky and Siegel adeptly orchestrated similar schemes, shipping alcohol across borders, sating the insatiable thirst for forbidden spirits during the era of prohibition. Their success wasn't confined to merely smuggling spirits, it also marked their ascent into the upper echelons of organized crime. The allure of wealth, power and influence captivated Bugsy setting the stage for his future exploits in an era marked by clandestine dealings and criminal enterprise. Money was the gateway to another facet of Benny Siegel's persona. Clad in custom-made suits, flaunting crocodile leather shoes and sporting impeccable hair, Bugsy cut a striking figure wherever he went. His penchant for looking the part was meticulous. He wouldn't grace a restaurant or nightclub without being impeccably dressed. Yet beneath this suave facade simmered a volatile undercurrent of uncontrolled rage and impulsivity. His wealth didn't deter his penchant for adrenaline-filled, poorly managed outbursts. In one instance, residing in the opulent Waldorf Astoria, Siegel resorted to dropping water balloons on unsuspecting police officers passing by, a prank that could have dire repercussions. In 1926, fate intersected with his volatile nature when he encountered a woman in a bar. She had testified against him six years earlier in a murder case involving an Irish teenager. Unable to rein in his fury, Bugsy unleashed a tirade of vitriol upon her, inciting a retaliatory exchange of words. What ensued next bore the brunt of his unrestrained anger. He followed her to a back room, assaulting and raping her, instilling fear that deterred her from reporting the incident, evading any consequences for his actions. The tempestuous nature of Bugsy Siegel, characterized by impulsive actions and unrestrained aggression, transcended mere verbal confrontations. His reputation as an assassin, purportedly responsible for several dozen murders, stemmed from a portrayal of a complete psychopath reveling in the act of killing. However, factual evidence supporting this claim remains scarce. Alleged involvement in high-profile murders during the Casta la Marseille War and subsequent eliminations of rivals like Maranzano bolstered his notorious image, despite a lack of concrete evidence. While his notoriety painted him as a psychopath reveling in bloodshed, 
a closer examination unveils a different reality. His rampant anger management issues often led to dire consequences where his actions outran rational thought. Nevertheless, amidst his tumultuous persona, he navigated the Prohibition era without succumbing to violent gang warfare, a testament to his ability to maneuver through treacherous waters without dragging his gang into a deadly conflict. The tensest confrontation Bugsy Siegel faced during his reign was with Waxy Gordon, although it wasn't entirely Siegel's doing. The feud commenced when Gordon's trucks were stolen, an act that received approval not just from Siegel, but also from Lansky. Rumors surfaced pointing to Lansky's subsequent cooperation with the authorities, leading to Gordon's imprisonment for a decade on charges of tax evasion. Gordon's former associates sought retribution, nearly assassinating Siegel and later bombing the gang's residence, causing Benny to sustain an injury from a flying piece of brick. Bugsy retaliated by orchestrating the murder of Tony Fabrazzo, whom he suspected of orchestrating the assassination attempts. Fabrazzo's demise effectively ended the feud. By late 1932, the imminent repeal of Prohibition loomed. Siegel's chapter in New York was drawing to a close, and a new chapter awaited him in Los Angeles, replete with movie stars and fresh criminal endeavors. Upon arriving in Los Angeles in 1933, Bugsy found himself embroiled in suspicion surrounding the Tony Fabrazzo case. To evade unwanted attention, he sought refuge out west. He struck a friendship with actor George Raft, a man whose youthful exploits mirrored Bugsy's own teenage years, characterized by gang affiliations, frequent altercations, and unlawful dealings. However, Raft's creative talents were noticed by gangster Oni Madden, persuading him to shift from thievery to dancing, which spared George from the typical fate of a hardened criminal. This transition catapulted Raft from dancing in New York clubs to a career in Hollywood, where his criminal background lent itself beneficially to the burgeoning gangster movie trend. Bugsy, accompanied by Raft, delved into the world of movies in Los Angeles. Raft became Siegel's mentor, guiding him through the nuances of filmmaking introducing him to the finest dining establishments, elite clubs, and a plethora of movie stars. Mesmerized by the glamour of Hollywood, Bugsy prolonged his stay, steering away from his original plans following the stock market crash during the Great Depression. Although drawn to the entertainment industry's allure, Siegel, facing financial setbacks, sought alternative means to rebuild his fortune post-prohibition. Following his stint in the realm of Hollywood glamour, Bugsy Siegel found himself reverting to his expertise, racketeering, upon his return to Los Angeles. However, the structure of the underworld in this new territory differed significantly from his experiences in New York. Unlike the forceful control exerted by gangsters in New York, Los Angeles's illicit money-making operations were controlled by businessmen intricately tied to corrupt local authorities. This system thrived on the implicit support of public officials who turned a blind eye to the thriving casinos, brothels, and other lucrative but unlawful businesses, funneling substantial amounts of money. At the helm of this intricate web was Guy McAfee, a former police captain turned kingpin who orchestrated and controlled the local criminal underbelly. Most of the city's brothels, casinos, and betting establishments operated under his purview. This modus operandi bore striking resemblances to the notorious racketeering system depicted in the narrative about Atlantic City boss Enoch Johnson. The involvement of everyone, from the mayor to the police force, underscored the gravity of the network. Initially, Bugsy encountered significant challenges navigating this novel landscape. Despite his aspirations for a substantial slice of the pie, he had to contend with scrapping for mere crumbs. However, the tides shifted in 1938 when the corrupt syndicate headed by McAfee faced legal repercussions. The ensuing legal proceedings resulted in the suspension or imprisonment of those involved, paving the way for new players to step into the power vacuum. Siegel, alongside two other contenders, John Roselli and Jack Dragna, vied for control. Roselli hailed from the Chicago outfit, while Dragna led a local family, backed by New York's Lucchese family. Bugsy, on the other hand, boasted connections with another New York family, the Genovese. Although neither Roselli nor Dragna held any fondness for Siegel, they found themselves compelled to tread carefully due to Bugsy's associations with influential figures from the Big Apple. With McAfee's downfall, the trio embarked on dividing his extensive holdings. Bugsy, 
along with his operatives led by Mickey Cohen, began to assert control by coercing casino operators and bookmakers into paying tribute. Taking over establishments previously run by McAfee's men, such as Eddie Nellis's lucrative chain, which raked in a staggering $10 million annually in today's valuation, Siegel swiftly amassed power. Eventually, McAfee was coerced into yielding to the new owners, lest he risk losing everything. Witnessing the immense profitability of union racketeering, Bugsy discerned the potential and magnificence of this avenue for wealth generation. Bugsy Siegel's foray into the movie industry was intertwined with his involvement in the union and his connections with notorious figures like Lepke Bacalter. He briefly worked under Lepke, undertaking militant assignments such as targeting labor leaders deemed undesirable. This stint equipped Bugsy with an acute understanding of intimidation tactics and the art of asserting control. After gaining control of the union, Bugsy adopted a strategy of leveraging strikes as a means to extort money from the studios. Given the indispensability of workers for movie production, the studios were compelled to comply with Siegel's demands. One of Siegel's most significant endeavors in Los Angeles involved the overtaking of off-track betting businesses via telegraph. Initially monopolized by Moses Annenberg, who established the novel idea of transmitting racing information from tracks to remote betting offices via telegraph, this lucrative venture garnered immense profits. Annenberg's company transmitted details from 29 race tracks to over 15,000 subscribers in multiple countries, including the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Cuba, by the late 1930s. However, Annenberg found himself embroiled in severe trouble by the late 1930s. His conflicts with the Chicago outfit, coupled with mounting tax evasion charges, led to his incarceration for a three-year term in 1939, coupled with exorbitant fines amounting to a modern equivalent of $150 million. Forced to sell his company, Siegel attempted to secure the West Coast portion, but was rebuffed by Annenberg, who opted to sell to his comrade Mickey McBride. McBride eventually sold the company to James Reagan due to incessant pressure from the Chicago outfit, thwarting Siegel's attempts to claim control. Faced with the failure to seize the existing company, Siegel resolved to create a new venture, intending to intercept customers by leveraging bookmakers. Despite facing resistance from both Reagan and the Chicago mob, Bugsy's determination to establish his foothold in this lucrative realm remained unwavering. Bugsy Siegel's rise to prominence in the underworld was marked by strategic expansions and shrewd negotiations. His foray into Phoenix initiated a sequence of takeovers, extending through Arizona, Los Angeles, and eventually Las Vegas. While Las Vegas was already secured through negotiation, Siegel made significant payments to Reagan, establishing control over the Vegas bookmakers. These moves were pivotal, compelling most bookmakers in Arizona and Los Angeles to align with Siegel, opting to avoid potential threats to their lives rather than use Reagan's services. This expansion exponentially multiplied Bugsy's income, far surpassing his earnings during the Prohibition era. Estimates pegged his annual income at over half a million dollars, a princely sum that in today's value would surpass seven million dollars. Apart from these ventures, Siegel had a stake in numerous establishments, including restaurants and clubs in Los Angeles, where he earned a percentage from his dealings. Additionally, he owned parts of a floating casino in L.A., a share in a Vegas racetrack, and managed casino games for the local elite. Despite his flamboyant image, Bugsy was exceedingly serious about the money he earned. Known for his exactitude in financial dealings, he insisted on paying the precise amounts owed, refusing to overpay even by a cent. This peculiar trait highlighted the paradox within Siegel's persona, a man willing to spend on luxury, yet staunchly adamant about not overpaying for anything. Siegel's eccentricities didn't end with his financial practices. He possessed a penchant for spontaneous adventures, often venturing off on treasure hunts or chartering yachts to deserted islands in pursuit of untold riches, leaving his businesses unchecked. Additionally, he entertained the idea of assassinating Hermann Göring, showcasing a blend of audacity and impulsiveness in his thoughts and actions. Amidst his underworld dealings, Siegel found companionship with individuals from diverse backgrounds, including Dorothy de Frasso, the wife of an Italian count. 
Moreover, Bugsy's circle included renowned movie stars like Cary Grant, Clark Gable, and Frank Sinatra, who frequented his lavish parties in L.A. However, despite his social standing among the Hollywood elite, rumors about Siegel's violent tendencies created an air of unease among his acquaintances. Nevertheless, Bugsy's criminal pursuits didn't escape public attention. An arrest following an assassination attempt raised eyebrows, causing a rift between Siegel and some of his movie star friends, altering the dynamics of his social circle. In 1939, Bugsy Siegel accompanied Dorothy de Frasso to Italy, where he gathered intelligence on Goering's meeting with Mussolini. De Frasso played a crucial role in dissuading Siegel from attempting to assassinate Goering, an act that Bugsy later regretted abandoning. Speaking of de Frasso, Bugsy's association extended beyond her, encompassing a multitude of high-profile friendships. His social circle boasted connections with iconic Hollywood figures like Cary Grant, Clark Gable, Gary Cooper, George Raft, Jimmy Durante, and Frank Sinatra. Siegel's allure captivated these luminaries, despite persistent rumors about his violent nature, leaving his celebrity friends somewhat apprehensive during their interactions. Beyond his criminal enterprises, Bugsy harbored aspirations of entering the acting world. His desire for Hollywood stardom led him to experiment with acting on movie sets, emulating George Raft's performances. Raft recalled an incident where Siegel, on a movie set, replicated Raft's lines and gestures flawlessly, impressing those present. Raft even believed that with proper training, Bugsy had the potential to pursue a career in acting. Additionally, Bugsy indulged in filming monologues from famous movies using his personal camera, intending to showcase his talent to studios someday. However, Siegel grappled with the fear of rejection, dreading that any refusal could spiral into scandal or worse, violence. Despite his aspirations, Bugsy's acting endeavors never materialized into a career. The trajectory of his supposed Hollywood journey was overshadowed by the dark clouds of his criminal past and the fear of rejection by studios. His ambitions in Tinseltown were curtailed by the stark reality of his criminal connections and the infamous incidents associated with his name. The roots of Siegel's tarnished reputation in Hollywood traced back to a pivotal event, the successful assassination attempt on Harry Greenberg, a snitch from Louis Lepke Bukalter's gang in New York. Although the assassination was carried out efficiently, one of Siegel's associates, Albert Tannenbaum, turned informant, leading to Siegel's arrest on charges of Greenberg's murder. Despite a lack of substantial evidence beyond Tannenbaum's testimony, Bugsy faced trial but was eventually acquitted. Nonetheless, this arrest stirred up a whirlwind of controversy in Hollywood, prompting many of his movie star friends to distance themselves from Bugsy, refraining from visiting his residence. The incident cast a shadow on Siegel's aspirations in the film industry and severed some of his key relationships in Hollywood, reshaping the dynamics of his social circle and marking a turning point in his perception within the glamorous world of movie stars. Bugsy Siegel's aspirations as a respected businessman in Los Angeles shattered amidst the turbulence of controversies and dashed dreams of pursuing an acting career. Bereft of opportunities and seeking a fresh start, Siegel's gaze shifted towards a burgeoning city with new prospects, Las Vegas, the burgeoning desert town that would soon transform into the epicenter of gambling and luxury. The association between Bugsy Siegel and Las Vegas has become ingrained in popular culture. Revered as the pioneer and forefather of the modern gambling capital, Siegel's role in catalyzing the mob's interest in the town is often glorified. However, Historical accuracy reveals that Bugsy wasn't the architect behind the first casino hotel, nor did the ill-fated Flamingo originate solely from his vision. The saga of Bugsy Siegel and the Flamingo, albeit lacking in historical veracity, embodies an enthralling narrative. Laden with elements of love, blind faith in ideas, and a tragic twist, this account captured imaginations, transcending beyond mere documentation. However, it's crucial to discern the factual underpinnings from the dramatic rendition. Contrary to the compelling story attached to Bugsy, the true pioneer credited with erecting the first casino hotel in Las Vegas was Tommy Hull. Legend has it that Hull's serendipitous encounter with a flat tire while passing through Vegas led to a profound realization. 
he noticed the ample traffic passing by, inspiring the idea of opening a casino hotel to cater to travelers. Siegel's notoriety overshadowed Hull's pioneering efforts, gradually transforming Bugsy's name into a symbol of Las Vegas's inception in the public consciousness. The enduring appeal of Siegel's narrative, while captivating a wider audience, inadvertently obscured the contributions and stories of others involved in the city's gambling evolution. Las Vegas's captivating backstory, interwoven with both factual and embellished accounts, reflects a blend of reality and the enticing allure of storytelling. While Bugsy Siegel's imprint on Las Vegas remains prominent in the collective imagination, acknowledging the untold stories of other pioneers like Tommy Hull adds depth and richness to the gambling capital's vibrant history. During the early stages of Las Vegas' emergence as a gambling destination, the landscape was dotted with modest, locally-oriented casinos. However, everything changed when Tommy Hull entered the scene. In April 1941, Hull introduced the El Rancho Vegas Casino along with a 110-room hotel, shifting the focus to attracting tourists. The El Rancho Vegas swiftly proved to be a lucrative venture, inspiring others to follow suit. In November 1941, the El Cortez debuted, slightly smaller in scale than its predecessor. However, by December 1942, the competition to establish larger, more opulent casinos was in full swing. The Last Frontier Casino unveiled with a range of amenities including a pool, sun deck, tennis courts, stables, and a 170-room air-conditioned hotel exemplified this trend. Witnessing the success of these ventures, discussions about new entertainment complexes reverberated across Vegas. Amidst this burgeoning casino landscape, Bugsy Siegel appeared on the Las Vegas horizon in the early 1940s, initially attempting to purchase the El Rancho Vegas. Despite several rejections, Siegel's persistent pursuit eventually led to the acquisition of the El Cortez in 1945 for $600,000. He successfully persuaded his associates, Meyer Lansky, Mo Sedway, and several individuals from the New York Mafia to invest in Vegas. Ten investors equally shared the ownership of El Cortez, marking Siegel's initial foray into the city's gaming scene. Capitalizing on the anticipated post-war expansion of Las Vegas, Siegel sold El Cortez a year later for $766,000, reaping a profitable return. Buoyed by this success, Siegel rallied his investors for a more ambitious project, the conception of their own casino hotel. Thus, the inception of the Flamingo commenced, not initially driven by an obsessive desire to build the most luxurious casino, but propelled by Siegel's keen interest in ventures outside the business realm. However, amidst these developments, an essential figure emerged in Bugsy Siegel's life, Virginia Hill. Their affair would eventually play a pivotal role in shaping Siegel's fate. While the Flamingo's inception began as a venture driven by diverse passions and interests, the unfolding events, including Siegel's relationship with Virginia Hill, would soon intertwine with the trajectory of his ambitious casino project. Bugsy Siegel's life had a significant anchor from his days in New York, the presence of his wife, Esther. She embodied the epitome of an ideal wife, a gracious hostess, unwaveringly supportive and faithful. Throughout their time together, they maintained a comfortable lifestyle, shielded from the unsavory aspects of Bugsy's wealth accumulation. Esther and their two daughters remained blissfully unaware of the darker, illicit origins of their family's affluence. Despite his prolonged absences, which sometimes lasted for weeks, Esther remained steadfast, tolerating Bugsy's infidelities as he inevitably returned home, ensuring their continued care and security. However, everything changed when Virginia Hill entered Bugsy's life. Virginia's impact transcended that of a mere fling. She became an all-consuming passion for Siegel. Virginia mirrored Bugsy in her impulsive nature, love for the high life, and an intense appetite for vibrant emotions. Notably, Hill had a penchant for romantic involvement with gangsters, establishing herself in relationships with figures like Joe Epstein from the Chicago outfit, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, and Joe Adonis before meeting Bugsy. Virginia's arrival not only spelled the end of Bugsy's marriage to Esther, but also ushered in a whirlwind of chaos. 
Bugsy fell deeply in love with Virginia, desiring complete possession and control over her, a notion Virginia vehemently rejected. She refused to be tied down or restricted, capable of leaving Bugsy for another city or engaging with other men even when Bugsy was still married. Virginia's justification for her actions lay in Bugsy's marriage to Esther, a convenient rationalization for her own dalliances. This dynamic brewed a tempestuous cocktail of love, jealousy, and admiration in Bugsy. He was fiercely possessive, yet deeply enamored by Virginia's free-spirited nature, torn between his intense feelings for her and his disdain for her behavior. The emotional turbulence stemming from this relationship added yet another layer of complexity to Bugsy's already tumultuous life as he navigated between devotion to Virginia and the shattered remnants of his previous life with Esther. The intricate web of Bugsy Siegel's personal life mirrored the tumultuous nature of his relationships. His entanglement with Virginia Hill marked the dawn of a volatile emotional roller coaster where arguments and passionate reconciliations collided ceaselessly. Their relationship was akin to a closed trap, an emotional vortex that swept them through turbulent highs and lows. Their interactions swung dramatically between heated quarrels, escalating to yelling matches and object-throwing, and tender moments of intimate affection. There were days of idyllic harmony and mutual understanding, only to be followed by bitter fights that led to physical distance, separate living spaces, and extended periods of silence between them. This constant seesawing took a significant toll on Siegel's emotional stability, a condition that would later reverberate into his business ventures. However, at this stage, Siegel's erratic emotional state remained mostly under wraps from his business partners. He still stood as an eager participant in lucrative investment opportunities in Las Vegas. The idea to build the Flamingo Casino did not originate with Siegel. It was the brainchild of William Wilkerson, who had previously helmed the Hollywood Reporter magazine and owned several successful restaurants and nightclubs in Los Angeles. Wilkerson envisioned bringing a touch of Hollywood glamour to Vegas, intending to transform the typical casino experience into a high-society affair. His ambitious plan involved crafting elaborate interiors, a performance lounge for celebrities, and offering superior food and drinks to create an aura of sophisticated indulgence. Wilkerson's vision eventually became the standard model for modern-day Vegas casinos. However, Wilkerson encountered financial hurdles during the construction phase, prompting him to seek investors. This is where Siegel entered the picture, purchasing a significant stake in the project for $1 million and acquiring 66% ownership. Initially, Siegel was supportive of Wilkerson's concept, openly expressing admiration for the establishments he had operated in L.A., Yet, as construction progressed, Siegel became increasingly involved in the project, engrossed in debates about its design and implementation. Eventually, he found himself deeply entrenched in Wilkerson's vision, but a shift occurred. Siegel's desire for greater control and recognition grew, causing tension as he began vying for sole leadership and credit once the Flamingo Casino opened its doors. The swift fade of William Wilkerson's influence within the Flamingo Casino project was sealed when Bugsy Siegel orchestrated his departure. Siegel leveraged his newfound authority to coerce Wilkerson into selling his stake for $600,000. To solidify his dominance and quell any ambiguity about who held the reins, Bugsy established the Nevada Projects Corporation. In this maneuver, he appointed himself as the director positioning his initial investors as shareholders, effectively consolidating control under his purview. Fueled by an obsessive pursuit to manifest the most opulent casino in Vegas and eager to reclaim the recognition he lost in Los Angeles, Siegel threw himself into the project. Driven by his fiery resolve, he assumed direct control over the construction site. However, his enthusiasm overshadowed his knowledge of construction and a series of costly mistakes ensued. His inexperience led to substantial financial losses. One instance saw Siegel approving the completion of a room designed for his use, only to demand an expensive roof redesign as he felt the ceiling was too low, a $22,000 blunder. Another costly error emerged with the incorrect construction of the kitchen, requiring a $30,000 overhaul to rectify space constraints caused by improperly installed industrial ovens. 
However, the most comical blunder surfaced toward the end of construction when a new boiler room was built without installing the boilers beforehand. This oversight meant that the boilers couldn't fit through the existing hallways or windows, forcing costly alterations. These repeated mistakes, coupled with Siegel's penchant for the finest and most expensive elements, led to continual financial setbacks. To salvage the hemorrhaging budget, Siegel resorted to selling off shares of the Nevada Projects Corporation. Initially invested with a million dollars, Siegel's constant demand for additional investments from his partners ballooned the figure to an eye-watering four million dollars. This escalating financial strain began to sour relations with his investors, exacerbating tensions and dissatisfaction among them, ultimately intensifying Siegel's push to seek further investments, fueling an increasingly unsustainable situation. The ambitious decision by Bugsy Siegel to hasten the opening of the Flamingo Casino, despite the incomplete hotel section, resulted in a tumultuous inauguration on December 26, 1946. With a partially finished hotel and adverse weather conditions causing prominent stars to miss the grand opening, the atmosphere lacked the anticipated sparkle. The casino's misfortune further compounded the situation as guests left the premises with heavier pockets than when they arrived. This fortune favored the gamblers. For instance, renowned player Nick Danilos exited the Flamingo with an impressive $500,000 in winnings after just three nights of gambling. However, the casino faced significant losses, tallying a staggering $300,000 within its first two weeks of operation. Acknowledging the mistake of the premature opening, Bugsy realized that guests were winning more due to their early departures to seek accommodations elsewhere. This revelation prompted him to close the Flamingo temporarily, aiming to complete the hotel quietly. The casino reopened on March 1, 1947, marking a more successful venture, showcasing a profit of $250,000. Nevertheless, amidst the chaos of construction mishaps and tumultuous clashes with Virginia Hill, Bugsy alienated many individuals. This friction culminated in a contract for his life. Tragically, Bugsy met his demise in June 1947 when assailants targeted him at his Los Angeles residence, firing fatal shots while he read the newspaper. The widely circulated story attributes his assassination to New York Mafia investors, suspecting Bugsy of embezzlement or his complicity in Virginia Hill's financial activities involving Swiss bank accounts. Siegel's death remains a pivotal moment, entwined with intrigue and conspiracy, a chapter that shrouds the history of the Flamingo and Vegas's casino world in mystery and notoriety. Upon delving deeper into the circumstances surrounding Bugsy Siegel's demise, it becomes evident that multiple versions and potential motives swirl around his tragic end. One plausible narrative suggests Russell Brophy, the proprietor of a telegraph company in Los Angeles, held a grudge against Bugsy for orchestrating a violent assault on him and transferring bookmakers to another company while Brophy was hospitalized. This incident fostered resentment, possibly prompting Brophy to seek retribution. Another potential perpetrator mentioned in this web of conjectures is Mo Sedway, Bugsy's close associate since their time in New York. Their relationship soured during the Flamingo's construction when Siegel ejected Sedway from the casino for expressing interest in running for the Nevada State Legislature. This action was perceived as betrayal, and Sedway's involvement in Siegel's assassination remains a speculation. Virginia Hill's brother, Chick, surfaces as another plausible suspect. Allegedly, the escalating conflicts between Bugsy and Virginia coupled with Chick's fear for his sister's safety due to Bugsy's abusive behavior, might have motivated him to intervene. Additionally, Chick might have struck a deal to safeguard his sister's life in exchange for orchestrating Bugsy's demise, although Hill's involvement in embezzling money from the Flamingo's construction site is a subject of debate. The enigmatic circumstances of Bugsy's death, regardless of the orchestrator or motivation, underscore the repercussions of his vices and decisions. Whether it was the mob's dissatisfaction with the casino's construction or business rivals aggrieved by Siegel's practices, or even Virginia Hill acting out of self-preservation, the consequences outweighed all else. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel's story epitomizes a man whose vices ultimately led to his ruin. 
If you've enjoyed this video and want more heart-pounding content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Stay vigilant, stay fearless, and stay tuned for more bone-chilling adventures on Survival Horror Channel. Thanks for watching, and until next time.